part of. And we know that uh, when we look around ourselves in the world today, that we often see instances of hate and bias. And as educators, um, we want to build a better world. That's what education is essentially, is trying to build the future that we want to be a part of. And so I'm Chris Heavey, the Executive Vice President and Provost of uh, UNLV. And uh, I worked with a group of people to bring these conversations together. And this is the first of four Hate Uncycled events. Um, and I wanna give a quick shout out to uh, Roberta Sabbath, who was a key partner in this event to get it started. And also to uh, Juliet Casey, Joanna DeBella, uh, from my office, and Katie Griffin, Karen Hollingsworth, Adam Christ, and Kimberly Pons Kendro, who laid the foundation for all four of these conversations. So to get us kicked off, um, broadly speaking, we talk a lot about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and our goal to have all three. When I think about that as an educator, I think about the fact that diversity is a, just a natural state of the world. Diversity exists. It's equity and inclusion that we need to be intentional in building. And right now, the COVID pandemic is one of the major things that is uh, the whole world is struggling with. And we know in all of these types of major events, and we've seen it very vividly in this one, that it has impacted the world differentially. And those are a reflection of the fact that we haven't yet built a fully equitable and inclusive environment. And so I'm delighted to welcome this panel here today of experts who all know a lot more about uh, this topic than I do. And so I'm gonna hand the floor over to them to lead this discussion. But I first wanna just start with some quick introductions. And so I'll name the panelists and I'll let them introduce themselves and tell you where they're coming to us from. And then I'll uh, hand it over to my co-host, uh, to get the conversation going. And so my co-host is April Cruda. April. Hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is April Cruda. I am a graduate student in the Master's in Public Health program at UNLV. Um, I'm part of the UNLV contact tracing team for the School of Public Health in partnership with the Southern Nevada Health District. Um, last semester, I was one of the supervisors for our team. And now this semester, I am currently the training coordinator who's in charge of training everybody. Well, welcome. Thank you for being here, April. And Sean Gerstenberg, another one of the co-hosts for this conversation. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Sean Gerstenberger, and I'm the Dean of the UNLV School of Public Health. And uh, I have the privilege of working uh, with all these folks here today uh, in collaboration with our Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition and the contact tracing team and a few other efforts that you'll hear about today. And Brian Labus, who, if you don't know him, uh, he will introduce himself, but he's a household name around my household, at least. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian Labus. I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, and I'm an assistant professor in the UNLV School of Public Health. Uh, for the last year, I've been doing nothing but COVID work, really, because that's what infectious disease epidemiologists do. So I've been helping UNLV uh, decide how we're going to respond to this. I'm also on the governor's medical advisory team, uh, and I'm advising a number of different groups in the community on how best to deal with COVID in our community. Welcome, Brian. Erica Marquez. Hi, and thank you for having me. I'm Erica Marquez. I am an assistant professor at UNLV School of Public Health, and I'm on the leadership team of the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition, and I have had the fortunate opportunity to work with everyone on, on this call um, in response to COVID edu education and outreach efforts in vulnerable communities. Thank you for being here, Erica. And Jose Melendrez. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Jose Melendres. I am with the uh, School of Public Health. I coordinate the Office of Community Partnerships, and I currently serve as chair for the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition, which is an initiative in, in collaboration with the School of Public Health and, uh, again, engaging everything COVID-19 for the past year uh, as it relates and, and engages uh, and impacts vulnerable populations. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Jose. Andre C. Wade. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Wade, State Director for Service Inequality and Service Inequality. Maybe a little bit louder, Andre. Give me one second. How's that? A little better, yeah. If you just speak loudly into that mic, it should be good. All right, my name is Andre Wade, State Director for Silver State Equality and Silver State Equality Institute. We're a statewide LGBTQ civil rights organization, um, uh, male pronouns. Um, we are a recipient, a grant recipient um, for COVID work with the uh, UNLV School of Public Health. 
and I am a member of the Nevada Office of Minority Health and Equities Advisory Council and a chair of the Governor's Task Force on HIV Modernization. And I also am an adjunct prof uh, instructor for the Interdisciplinary Gender and Ethnic Studies uh, Department teaching uh, gender studies and glad to be here. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank you for being here. Miranda Moreno. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Miranda Moreno. I am a recent graduate from the School of Public Health, and I was the former project coordinator for the COVID Education and Outreach Grant. Thank you for having me. Great. And thank you also for being here, Miranda. And last but certainly not least, uh, Bliss Raka Trouts. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Bliss Rekwa Trouts. I'm the executive director of Arriva Las Vegas Worker Center. We're a nonprofit organization working primarily with domestic workers, uh, day laborers, and low wage mixed status immigrant families. And our mission is to inform, empower, and organize immigrant families to stand up for themselves and, and uh, work for equity and inclusion for their families. Thank you so much for being here and thanks for everybody for being here. I know we're all looking forward to hearing this discussion. And so, April, what is on your mind? Thank you uh, for the introduction. So uh, what is on my mind? Let me uh, tell you a little bit first about my background and what brought me to the work uh, that I do today. Uh, in my graduate career at UNLV, I can say that I feel honored and recharged uh, by the new opportunities that have presented themselves to me since I've moved to Vegas. Um, I'm, I'm from the Bay Area, California. And so where I'm from is uh, a very diverse environment, lots of um, ethnic and racial minorities, myself included being Filipino. Um, but I grew up in San Jose, which is predominantly Hispanic, Latino, Asian, very liberal. Uh, we're near San Francisco, so you can imagine the diversity there. Um, but my passion for public health kind of stirred up when I learned in school and saw for myself uh, with the work that I used for the city of San Jose Parks and Recreation Department um, that my community, neighborhood, people close to home uh, could be in better shape. Um, and this is in terms of like community and neighborhood planning, programs that are in place or offered and resources that are provided. Um, so I was lucky enough to be a part of the city and these recreation programs, community centers um, that essentially bring the community together. You know, they offer unique experiences that these families would otherwise not have access to, um, provide good role models for the kids, provide education, health education, or just a simple place to go where it was safe and supportive. And so I realized when I look around that this is what every community needs, right? Some support, some unity uh, to be heard, to be seen and shown that there are people on your side. Um, and so with today's topic, like health, public health, social justice, equity, community engagement, um, particularly in regards to the pandemic, um, I was presented with an amazing opportunity to work on the team at UNLV for contact tracing in partnership with Southern Nevada Health District. Um, how amazing is that? Um, and it was not only as a contact tracer, but in a more supervisory role. I was honored. Um, but to be able to help our community during such an important time in history, in health, in public health, um, society, and so forth. Um, and so what we've done is we've hired a team of up to 150 to 200 contact tracers. Um, and per guidelines set by Southern Nevada Health District, our students, uh, grad students, undergrads, PhDs, uh, public health, nursing, and even other more concentrations on campus, we've all come together. We've got trained on the process and we're conducting these disease investigations in Clark County. Um, so essentially our work is to, you know, what is contact tracing? It's um, to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak in Clark County by conducting contact tracing efforts and disease investigation to help slow or stop the spread of COVID-19 in our community. And so as public health, we're following up with anyone who was infected by COVID-19, uh, providing health education, offering resources, and helping them navigate their infection, um, answer questions and concerns, help them navigate through isolation and quarantine moving forward. And then we also give, you know, the standard public health advice that's provided by SNHD and CDC to help stop the spread. So my role and experience in doing the work um, as a supervisor and now a trainer, uh, my role is to ensure that our investigations from our team are meeting quality standards set by SNHD. 
Um, this means answering any questions from investigators, training on how to handle and respond to difficult situations or hard conversations with people. As you know, these might come up. Um, handling those complex exposures and cases, reporting and notifying SNHD as needed, and just handling any cases that get escalated to the leadership team. And so in my experience already, I'm seeing a bit of hesitation or reservation when it comes to people that we contact, especially minorities. Um, so interacting with different cultures, um, I, I would say with this job in my experience, I've felt pretty pre prepared in handling, uh, working with different cultures, different ideas, norms, and concerns, and more of that. I would say learning cultural competence is very key in this role. You know, you're dealing with different cultures, perceptions on health versus what public health and our medical field and what the media might be saying. So it takes a great level of listening skills, I've learned, um, instead of just asking, you know, the series of questions and collecting information. I found that listening, um, having a conversation evokes a different response from people that we interact with. And so I try to stress this um, in our training sessions with our investigators on how to conduct these phone calls. Um, so, you know, what's on my mind, Chris asked. Um, well, with today's topic about health, you know, disparities, community engagement, in regards to this pandemic that virtually affects everyone, you know, in one way or another. So particularly when it comes to vulnerable populations, such as racial, ethnic, or sexual minorities, this is, you know, always a focus of public health. Um, what we do to ensure that these vulnerable populations are being addressed is that we collect demographic data when conducting our interviews. So questions on like racial and ethnic identity, as well as sexual identity are collected. We ask about, you know, any affiliation with federally recognized tribes or bands. Um, and so this allows us to know how the virus may or may not be disproportionately affecting different groups or communities so that we can be informed in directing our outreach efforts more diligently to those who need it. So, you know, the first step, which is what we're doing, is to collect that information and go from there. Um, so we do get a lot of cases who are racial or ethnic minorities. I'm not sure the exact percentage in Clark County. I know that we do have a large population of Hispanics in Clark County. If that actually reflects uh, that these communities are being disproportionately affected the, by the pandemic. But I have seen quite a few of these cases in my experience. Um, and what I'm seeing with these families who are affected is, one, people are kind of hesitant to give out any information, right? Any people they've been in contact with, their household, their family members, especially their children, there's a protective factor there, which makes sense. Um, two, there seems to be a lot of mistrust when it comes to health, uh, the US healthcare system, privacy, freedom, rights, everything like that, especially with all of the tension going on in the world today, people are even more mistrusting when they get a call from us, you know? And uh, three, I would say a lot of fear um, I'm sure everyone's feeling some level of fear right now, but, um, you know, this is a new d disease. We don't have all the answers to everything. There's a fear of getting sick. There's a fear of being judged in society if someone comes out positive. Uh, fear of family members getting sick or dying. Um, and then there's a fear of getting in trouble or telling on each other or fear of other things such as losing privacy, freedom, or rights being taken away as a result of disclosing in any information to us. So how do we respond to these kinds of concerns, our team? Well, our efforts emphasize providing any and all accurate information or health education to each person that we talk to on the virus or anything else like that as much as we can. Um, it's not just to get information out of people. We also want to extend our handout and help in any way that is within our scope. So. You know, we're well educated on the different resources that are available within our community, and we direct people to these resources as needed. Things like housing and food assistance, pharmacy and healthcare, um, COVID testing sites, mental health and grief, homeless or crisis cases, and things like that. Um, we're, of course, protecting personal information and privacy through HIPAA. That's a priority. Um, and then in regards to the fear, fear is usually caused by the unknown. Right. So to mitigate this, we try to just provide information, answer questions, listen, clarify the gray area of their concerns and give clear guidelines and instructions on how to handle uh, their symptoms, their isolation moving forward. And then just reminding them that our goal is to help stop the spread 
of COVID in our community, right? Through educating them and just reassuring them that health is out there. Um, and then the last thing I just kind of want to touch on, another thing I'm seeing is that, and maybe our presenters can speak to this uh, during the talk, is that lots of families of racial or ethnic minorities that we talk to, their biggest concern is work, right? Lots of times these people are putting themselves at risk every day in order to support their family. So they're working in public places and communities, uh, jobs that require them to be there physically or be around people. There's no option to work from home. These people are caretakers or housekeepers or working in casinos, and there's no option to miss out on a day's work, let alone a 10 to 14 day quarantine period. So they just risk, you know, becoming sick themselves. And also that risk goes into getting someone else sick as well, such as their family. And so that was kind of weighing heavy on me, on my heart. Uh, families need to make a living. Kids need to be in school. And this pandemic has really crippled or made it really hard for people to do that. Um, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, I just want to say I'm thankful for this experience to work in the community. Um, I see public health at work in our city. I'm a part of it. Um, being a grad student at UNLV and being able to put everything I worked hard for into effect, helping out during an important time in our community, it's pivotal for our public health. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Lavis, who is on the panel today, who presented me with the opportunity. Uh, believed in me, gave me a chance, and really believed in the whole UNLV contact tracing team. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Lavis here today. Um, he serves as the principal investigator for the contact tracing efforts at UNLV. So thank you, Dr. Lavis. Um, my first question for you is, uh, can you talk about why it was important for UNLV to be involved in contact tracing and to employ students as contact tracers? Oh, well, thank you, April. Um, and, and based on your comments, I think everybody can see why it's great to have UNLV students involved in this particular project, because we have students like April uh, helping to lead our teams that can uh, really think of all these different issues and, and help us come up with a way that is best going to support our community. I wanted this to, uh, to be a UNLV project for several reasons. First, uh, we wanted to help the community. This is what we do in public health. This is a, a public health crisis, and this is the kind of time when public health needs to step up. So really, it's our, our civic duty to be involved in something like this and actually uh, support uh, those efforts in our community to investigate the cases. We could bring a workforce to this that really reflects who we are. Our students really reflect who uh, the, the people of Southern Nevada are. We have about 20 different languages that our, our contact tracers speak. Uh, any group in town, you can probably find people on our team from that group, however you define it, whether it's along racial ethnic lines or some other lines. We have basically a broad representation of our community on that team. Um, I also wanted to use this as a training opportunity for our students. We have public health students who want to go into the workforce and do exactly this. And this is an amazing opportunity to get those job uh, skills, to build that experience and do something that, that really helps the community. And with the size of team that we needed, we had to expand beyond public health. So it also provides us the opportunity to introduce students from all over campus to the field of public health. We have a lot of people from uh, different medical fields and health related fields, but we have also people from all sorts of majors on campus. Uh, and they are being introduced to public health, and this may, uh, it probably won't change their career trajectory. You know, if you wanted to study architecture coming into it, this probably won't change it, but you'll at least start to think about public health issues as you deal with these things in the community, uh, as you vote in elections, as you support different positions, and you'll start to build those important public health features into kind of your day-to-day -day life. Thank you, Dr. Lewis, and I can probably speak on behalf of all of our team um, that we're so grateful for this opportunity. Um, another question for you is, uh, what cultural considerations were needed when developing protocols, responses, and such? For an outbreak like this, uh, people like to say that we're all in the same boat, um, but I would really disagree with that. We're all trying to weather the same storm, but we're all in a bunch of different boats. We all came into this in different ways, and every population in town has different issues that existed long before COVID was here and are just really being exacerbated uh, by this pandemic. 
it affects everybody differently because of the way we came into it. We'll see a difference in disease rates and we have to think, is this an actual difference in rates? Is it due to uh, systemic racism that led to long-term health problems in particular populations? Is it just the way that uh, uh, people are treated in our community that puts some of them at higher risk? It could be economic issues, health issues, sort of underlying factors there. So we can see different rates in populations because of that. We might see differences just in care-seeking behavior. So if the disease affects everyone the same way, some people have better, better medical care than others. And so they will be more likely to be identified. So it'll look like certain populations have higher rates and they really don't. What you're seeing is the, the reflection of a really economic differences that lead to better health care for some people in our population. Um, it could be, as April mentioned, a difference in our ability to talk to people. A lot of people don't want to talk to us. And so we may see different numbers because um, we investigate the cases and don't get the same information from everybody. We know these are the factors coming into this pandemic, and so we had to build our system with those sort of things in mind. We want a workforce that is culturally competent, that thinks about these issues and knows how to speak to people. Um, we sometimes just have language barriers. The simplest one that we deal with all the time is uh, the language you speak when you call somebody is not the same as the person you're trying to interview, and we have to have ways to deal with that. Uh, and make sure that we're appropriately talking to people in a language that they are comfortable with so they can understand what's going on. And so this is nothing new for public health. This is a challenge that we've faced for decades as we've investigated diseases. How do we ask questions in a way that are appropriate? How do we get the information that we need to do our analysis and uh, make sure that what we're asking is really what the person hearing us is, is answering and not taking some nuance because their culture is a little different than the way I'm asking it. So, those sort of things had to be built into this entire system nationwide with the standard questions we get from CDC and putting a, a group of people together that can ask those questions and take all of these cultural concerns into account as they're on the phone, having those conversations that April talked about with people who have recently been infected with COVID. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Levis. Um, I'd actually like to now turn it over to Dr. Sean Gersenberger, um, my co-host, Dean of the UNLV School of Public Health. Well, thank you, April and Brian. Um, we certainly appreciate your comments on those areas. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Sean Gersenberger. I'm the Dean of the UNLV School of Public Health, and I get the privilege of working with all these uh, faculty, staff, students, and community partners. And I think very simply put, um, great universities do cutting as research that engages and empowers our community partners and it makes change that we can measure and i think that's in a nutshell what the school of public health really tries to do through training and research and development engagement and so it's my privilege to kind of lead the panels today a little bit and tell you about some of the projects that are ongoing you've already heard about the contact tracing team and some of the tremendous work that they're doing in this community to help end the pandemic. Um, but the, the second piece that I want to talk about a little bit today is uh, one of the uh, efforts ongoing called the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition that is housed in the School of Public Health. And so we kind of designed this coalition so that it would do all those things I just mentioned. It would take the, the best and brightest folks from our community, from the university and from our local population, and we got them together to solve problems. So I would like to transition over to that a little bit, and I'm gonna direct my first question over to um, Jose Melendrez. And Jose, if you could, could you tell us just a little bit about what the, the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition is and why it's important, how it contributes to public health in the state and you in the V and in our community. Sure, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition is actually, uh, we're now in our seventh year of working as a, a community-based organization. Uh, it was established, um, again, almost eight years ago, when uh, in collaboration with the Nevada State Department of uh, Health and Human Services, understanding and recognizing the need for uh, being able to engage diversity, equity, uh, communities in Nevada. And so with uh, in collaboration with key folks like uh, um, rest in peace, uh, former Assemblyman Tyrone Thompson, uh, current Senator Dina Neal, uh, Irene Bustamante Adams, uh, Olivia Diaz, folks who were all in the assembly and at the state legislature, 
uh, we all work together to bring to bring this coalition to fruition uh, to reestablish the Office of Minority Health at the, at the uh, with Health and Human Services. Um, and to their credit, and with some support from them, uh, thanks to our dean and some of the relationships that have been established there between UNLV and DHHS, um, they provided some seed money to establish what is now the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition. And the purpose of the coalition was really twofold. One was to work with the state, uh, the new Office of Minority Health and Equity, to identify resources, grants, um, opportunities for training from a culturally competent perspective, make sure that all the diversity and equity voices were represented at the table uh, and, and to collaborate where needed. Um, the other part of why the coalition exists uh, is to work with those policymakers and 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 uh, DHHS and all the other folks um, to hold them accountable to work with them when when the work was not being done or when the right folks weren't being invited to the table that needed to be there, then the coalition was one place for those folks to have a voice and for us to bring everybody who needed to be there together and be at the table. And so we've been able to do a lot of work in, the, in again now in, the, in our seventh year. We've been able to do a lot, a lot of work with community folks. Uh, we have over 200 different uh, organizations and groups that are a part of the coalition. Um, you know, obviously everything that's happened in the past year because of the COVID-19 has really transformed the coalition uh, uh, into uh, uh, a place where in collaboration with UNLV now back working with the School of Public Health, that we can really dive into the community to make sure that information is getting out, that understanding why the COVID-19 has such an impact, especially on diversity and equity populations. Uh, when you look at all the information, I'm sorry, that's my dog barking in the background, uh, but uh, live live TV, right? So, um, so the the need has been more has really, you know, I think uh, Dr. Labor said earlier, these are not things that we're dealing with in terms of uh, of inequity and, and lack of diversity in the area of public health. Uh, and so um, what the what the COVID-19 has done is really brought that to the forefront, exactly how the inequities are, how they play out, and how they impact different communities. And so the coalition, in collaboration with UNLV, the School of Public Health, we are one place where we can give voice to those who don't traditionally have voice, where we can bring those issues to the forefront, and we can, we can collaborate on different initiatives that bring resources into the community, especially right now, during this critical time of dealing with the pandemic, COVID-19, and everything that needs to be done. So that's a little bit about the coalition and the work that we do. Well, thank you, Jose, for that summary. One of the uh, larger projects that we've received over the last six to eight months was a, a program called the One Community Campaign. Um, Dr. Marquez was the principal investigator on that award that came through. Uh, you may have uh, recognized that campaign from the singing mask on television, uh, the please don't leave me mask that kind of stuck in everybody's head. Um, that was one small part of the campaign, but I think a wildly effective one. Um, Dr. Marquez, would you mind telling us a little bit about that one community campaign, uh, what its purpose was and how it engaged our community partners and tried to do all the things that everybody mentioned over the last few minutes here? Sure, and thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, the One Community Campaign uh, was really born out of an initiative, an ask from the state to the coalition and the School of Public Health to really engage our communities and uh, particularly our communities that have been highly impacted by COVID. And um, we were honored to ha have said, yes, absolutely, we want to do this work, but I'll, I'll be very honest, you know, um, devising a targeted outreach approach for seven priority communities that have been devastated by COVID is no easy task, right? And so we really had to go to the table and think about um, as a leadership team, um, how do we make sure that our communities want to heard? How do we make sure that the messaging that goes out into these communities uh, addresses their concerns, right? Um, and, you know, we wanted to reinforce the risk reduction measures, obviously, that were really, really important, but also making sure that we were tailoring each of these, um, these messages to those communities. And so there was without any question, I think, very early on that we knew that this was not an ask that us as a university, as a school, could do by ourselves. Um, and that in order to do that, we had to engage our community leaders and they had to have a seat at the table. 
They had to have uh, the opportunity to help us inform how this was going to work and how we were going to get into each of these respective communities. And so I, I think it, it speaks to one, our unique position at, as a university on what we can do on the ground, but it speaks so much volume in terms of how we work with our communities and how we work with our students. You'll hear about from one of our recent graduates about her work on this campaign. And so what we focused on is making sure that we got community voice. We conducted over 25 focus groups across the state to understand what, what the impacts were in each of these respective communities, to really try to get a better sense of how do we prepare when the vaccine was going to come, come out. So what are those target messaging? What are the things and concerns that these communities were sharing with us that we knew we were going to have to prepare for and, and, and mounting our response moving forward? Um, and our and our media efforts happened across the board. We realized we're working with a diverse set of populations that one social media couldn't be our only outlet. Um, we really need to make sure that things were going on the ground into communities, communities that don't necessarily even speak English. So we had to make sure that that things were translated appropriately into languages that that were familiar to them and understandable to them. Um, so we used a whole diverse set of messaging, worked really closely with our community partners to really help us not only inform the campaign, but also to help us disseminate information into our communities. Well, thank you for that summary, and it's a, it's a great segue into a few of our next questions. One of the key themes that I've heard from everybody along the way is that we can't do these things alone. We have to do them with our community partners. Erica had mentioned the large number of focal groups that were done and some of those absolutely awesome folks in our communities, those community leaders. And we're privileged to have a couple of those here with us today. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Bliss and um, ask her a question about um, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about your organization and, and kind of what you do and then how this partnership helped you in the communities that you serve. Thank you. Um, I feel we were lucky to partner with the one community campaign over the last few months. Um, Arriba Las Vegas is a relatively young organization. We're three years old, but we are part of national networks that have been working with day laborers and domestic workers for decades. Um, so we work primarily with Spanish speaking, undocumented and mixed status families who have been significantly disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, prior to the pandemic, what our programs was, uh, was occupational safety and health. So safety and health in the construction industry. And the one community campaign gave us the opportunity to sort of pivot and say, what is what does it mean to do health and safety in the middle of a pandemic? Um, as an organization, we made a difficult decision to keep our doors open as most of our families, most of our workers and our members have significant barriers to access um, language barriers, technology barriers, uh, lack of Internet and computers in the home things that prevent them from having things that prevent folks from accessing the information and services that they need, particularly at a time like that we've been living through uh, in the last year. Something that was really important about partnering with the one community campaign for us as an organization, but more so for our members is recognizing that our members are experts in their own lives. They, they bring expertise, they bring in a, a very important perspective to help us understand uh, the health disparities that we have been seeing. And so in our members in focus groups and one on one conversations led to our members really becoming leaders in the community, in their homes, in their workplaces, um, in their churches and beyond to ensure that the information that that we're trying to promote in terms of COVID prevention, um, that it was reaching people, information from a trustworthy source um, and folks being confident in that information. And I think the other reason that it was really significant to partner on the One Community Campaign is that by engaging our members in these conversations and recognizing their expertise, it really underlined or highlighted um, 
what I think are some of the root causes for the health disparities that we see. Uh, so, for example, something that became very clear throughout the, the process with the One Community Campaign is that, in fact, folks did, in many cases, have access to information. They were aware um, of, of how to protect themselves or best practices to protect themselves against COVID transmission. But as April was sharing, political and economic realities prevented folks from acting it with the information they had in their best interest. And so that um, I can talk a little bit more about it in the coming question and answer. Um, but that not only informed our work in regards to um, health and safety education, but in terms of our um, our service and organizing priorities for the length of the pandemic and as, as we continue moving forward. Well, thank you, Bless. You've been a, a tremendous leader, not only in your community, but on the coalition. So we appreciate all that you have done. So thank you for that. Um, similarly, it is my privilege to introduce to you Andre, uh, also been a tremendous leader and advocate for the Minority Health and Equity Coalition. And uh, kind of the same question, Andre, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about the, uh, the organizations that you serve and uh, how those partnerships with the Nevada Minority Health and Equity Coalition help serve those communities better and why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me as well. Uh, similarly to Ariba, we've been around just for a short amount of time. Uh, we're going into our third year. So um, again, Silver State Equality is a statewide LGBTQ civil rights organization, um, and we are a program of Equality California with a work um, in COVID uh, for the LGBTQ community um, out in California. And so we um, have a C3 and C4 work. Um, so we do political work and we do public education work. And so um, right when COVID started to happen um, and we start to get a little bit of an understanding of its impact on the LGBTQ community, uh, we knew that just like with everything, uh, the LGBTQ community was uh, often left out of the conversation. So when it came to knowing specifically from a data perspective uh, the desperate impact uh, that COVID had on the LGBTQ community, what we had to do was glean from national um, information about how the LGBT community suffers a lot from comorbidities. Um, there's HIV for uh, men who have sex with men. Uh, there's high rates of cancer um, and then other factors like uh, rates of poverty, um, and depression that have this uh, compounding impact if you um, are impacted by the coronavirus and then COVID. And so like a lot of the organizations across the nation doing this work, we did our own advocacy within the state to encourage the Department of Health and Human Services to collect data on um, the LGBTQ community, what we call SOGI data or sexual orientation, gender identity data. And so it's, essentially it's just demographic data, but uh, by and large, uh, because of homophobia, fear, lack of education, there's a hesitancy um, to collect this information, to even ask the question. And there is usually a lack of training around it. So what ultimately happens is that the information doesn't get collected, so we just don't know. And so we encouraged the department um, to collect the data, and they decided to start with contact tracing. And so we were really excited by the time uh, September or so rolled around that we were hopeful that, uh, that the information was gonna start getting uh, collected. A little late, uh, but at least it was gonna be collected. Uh, unfortunately, we, we found out that uh, the implementation of the data collection has had its challenges, and it sounds like across the board, the information isn't being collected. Again, to what we know is that um, people aren't being trained, people are already hesitant to ask the question, um, so we are sort of left in the dark, but that is where Silver State Equality comes in to do this work for advocacy for our community and to continue to educate um, our partners on the importance. Because uh, essentially, again, sexual orientation and gender identity is a demographic question. So if you're going to ask someone about their, their age and their date of birth and where they live and their gender and race, uh, you can go ahead and ask the question about their sexual orientation and their gender, gender identity to relate it to trans. And it's an option. And so it's not as if someone's going to be uh, offended by providing that information. If anything, people are gonna be excited because they're actually gonna be seen. 
And so when the grant opportunity came around uh, with the UNLV's Department of Public Health, uh, we were very interested in um, the program and really glad that um, LGBTQ was a discrete uh, population that the uh, university was reaching out to. And at first we you know, declined to actually engage because we were in the midst of the election season and didn't feel we had the capacity. But uh, when they circled back, thankfully, um, to really encourage us to apply for the grant to make sure that the LGBTQ community um, had a voice, we took on the, the project and really glad that we did because we were able to hold uh, a few of those uh, 25 listening that mentioned. And we really got some great information uh, from people who were happy to engage uh, in the conversation just to have some social connection, right? Which is really the core of how this virus and this um, disease impacted people. So if you talk about the LGBTQ community who's often um, invisible, not seen, harassed, discriminated against, and uh, some people navigate their lives only in um, safely in LGBTQ spaces, when you are forced to stay home, maybe um, alone without those connections, or if you're a young person or really anyone who's not out to your uh, parents or caregivers or your roommate, I mean, it really becomes hard to show up as your everyday self. And so having these uh, listening sessions, we were able to hear people from people that outside of being impacted because of either getting the uh, virus or losing their job, that their social connections were really impacted. And again, that's something that the LGBTQ community struggles with anyway. Uh, one of our uh, participants um, had a really good point uh, that uh, the LGBTQ community, specifically uh, men who have sex with men, are used to uh, contact tracing in that we go to get tested for um, HIV and uh, STIs, STDs, um, hopefully a few times uh, a year. Uh, that's my public service announcement. And so we are asked about our uh, sexual health, um, our partners, our um, um, And if we and find out that we um, do have an infection of um, a communicable disease uh, that's sexually transmitted, then we were asked about our, our partners and, and you have to go through that list so the disease um, investigators can go out and do their contact tracing. And so that's something that uh, we've been doing in the state of Nevada since 1993. Uh, and so one of the other things that we talked about to find out like how this virus um, and disease was impacting the community was um, asking them how they felt in general. And people just kind of felt like, in some ways, their sexual orientation and their gender identity didn't necessarily matter, didn't necessarily play a factor, because at the end of the day, we're all just the same, and sometimes just these little things that um, make us a little different. But then people, I think, shared their you know, hesitancies, regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity, around getting information um, from a website or an app about their whereabouts or information about um, a virus. But lastly, we were able to find out um, well, who are their trusted sources? And so we're able to provide that information. And so as um, I believe it was April who mentioned that we weren't just uh, asking questions to, to be nosy or just to have information to, to, to sit on, we're actually using this information as part of a larger project. And we are looking forward to um, a report that I believe is gonna be written about the findings to uh, give back to our stakeholders and let them know that they really played a part, that they were seen, that they were visible um, by uh, the department, um, the School of Public Health, UNLV, and the community at large. So really happy that we uh, were invited to uh, uh, participate in the grant and we were awarded for all effort. Well, thank you, Andre, and, and thank you for your leadership. I think there's a, a couple of clear themes that we hear through this, right? That we're, we're clearly better together and it's really important for us to listen as much as it is for us to talk. And so uh, I think you all kind of got that across loud and clear. Um, I'd like to bring in one additional uh, perspective here and introduce Miranda. Uh, Miranda was the program coordinator for the One Community Campaign, also a recent graduate of our UNLV School of Public Health. And I'd love to hear your perspective on how uh, this opportunity allowed you to take what you learned in the classroom, see things put into action, and kind of how that transition worked and kind of what you've learned. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I just want to start off by saying that um, 
as much as we learn about other cultures and demographics through a textbook or in a classroom, um, we may never understand what it's really like to constantly face discrimination and stigma. Um, through my internship and some of my classes, such as multicultural health, uh, education and sexuality, health ecology and global health, I was able to gain some sense of cultural competency. Um, now I was raised Mexican, um, I'm from a family of immigrants, um, so there's definitely that sense of uh, exclusion, I guess you can say, but to really be involved in this project, um, it allowed me to gain a different perspective on what other cultures might, or demographics might face in terms of discrimination. Um, so I want to say that um, this helped to shape my perspective on the hardships of others. These were some of my favorite classes, the ones I just mentioned, um, simply because they brought to light uh, real life challenges um, that are not always in the public eye, but they are definitely an issue to society. Um, so I completed my internship through the Office of Community Partnerships uh, with Jose Melendres, um, where I had to make connections with people and I had to have a lot of face-to-face -face interaction um, and that definitely uh, helped to develop my communication skills. And this also gave me the ability to carry these skills into the One Community, community Campaign. Um, like Erica said, we were working with seven different target groups, uh, 10 different organizations. Um, so communication was definitely something that you had to have a strong suit in. Um, so my role in the One Community Campaign required me to be able to work closely with a variety of groups that each face their own struggle and they each have their own story to tell. Uh, it was definitely challenging because I was a new grad um, and they, they, it was, I guess you can say a bit out of my realm because I've never dealt with so many different um, groups, uh, especially the deaf community. They definitely spoke to me a lot. They opened my heart. Um, I had different uh, experience, I guess, uh, working with them because I think that's one of the main groups that we don't really encounter on a normal basis on the regular day to day. Uh, so to hear their hardships from every single group, um, definitely, definitely brought to light the, the struggles that they go through. So it also helped to give me a sense of privilege on my own uh, life that I carry. Uh, many people are facing unemployment, going hungry and can't pay their bills. So um, it, this was an educational campaign and I just want to, um, I have hope that we were able to help those who definitely needed it most with the information that we could provide. Well, thank you, Miranda. We're we're clearly in good hands with uh, students like April and Miranda uh, coming out of our programs. So, um, one of the um, themes that we mentioned was kind of that we're better together, and one way that we try and do that is through a process called uh, community-based participatory research. And Jose, I'm wondering if you could maybe tell us just briefly what community-based participatory research is and why it's important to implement as part of the coalition. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so community-based participatory research, when you talk about academics and the world of academics, uh, there's all kinds of different theories and ways that faculty do research. And so I was most fortunate when I did my, my graduate work at the University of Michigan, I was introduced to this method and through the field of public health. And so when I started working here um, and moved over to the School of Public Health, um, I'm, I'm very lucky to work for a dean and and our and now our provost who support community engagement as a way of doing public health work. And so one method of doing public health work is the utilization of what we call community based participatory research. It's a way to engage our community members as real partners in the process of, of doing any kind of community based work. So, you, you know, uh, a lot of people spend a lot of years becoming faculty and doctors and all this stuff that they do to become uh, academics. And so uh, we train our community partners on how to do research, how to run focus groups, how to ask questions, uh, how to do interviews, how to collect that data, how to evaluate programs. So they become um, community-based participatory research allows our community partners to be on the front line with us 
and do the research that needs to be done because almost you know almost any grant that you look at nowadays requires that there's data being collected how are you going to evaluate it uh, how are you going to prove that the outcomes you're saying should be happening or going to happen and so community cbpr community-based participatory research is one method to really create a full-on partnership and collaboration with our community partners again from my my perspective who are on the front lines of dealing with everything we have to deal with and so to make them active an active voice and active partners with us in the public health it just makes the work better and it, it allows us to be upfront and honest and transparent with all of the information that needs to be done again as the subject today right the issue of diversity equity and inclusion and how you engage vulnerable populations in this work against the pandemic so uh, cbpr is just one method that i truly believe in in engaging and building strong partnerships and, and uh, relationships uh, with our community friends well, thanks, Jose. Um, obviously, Erica, you as the PI were kind of tasked with making sure the community-based participatory research was realized in the one community project. Uh, could you perhaps tell us how that was realized? Sure. So we had the very fortunate opportunity to be trained by Dr. Barbara Israel from the Detroit Urban Research Center in Michigan. And um, one in part of that training, one of her partners, um, and this sticks with me, um, he, he said, uh, her, her community partner said uh it's about nothing's done about us without us right and that kind of really resonated with me right because that's kind of the core of what cbpr work is right that it's not just the research institution going in with like here's my problem i want to solve our research and, and do my research and kind of bounce out and that it's completely the opposite of that right it's about bringing our community partners to the table and, and making sure that they really have a seat at the table and that there's equity in that and that there's power sharing in that and that they actually have a voice to tell you that, hey, this is the concerns in my community. And like I said, we worked with seven different priority communities and not everything, like none of them had the same concerns. Um, and, you know, uh, Andre brought up contract tracing, like contract tracing, obviously something that the LGBTQ plus community were very familiar with. And so um, it wasn't necessarily a concern from them, but if we talk to our Latinx, our Hispanic, Latino populations, that was a whole different story about privacy, about concerns. And so it was really about making sure we heard that we had this feedback loop in um, developing material, sending that back out to our community partners and say, hey, is this address your your issues, your concerns, give us feedback. So we had to be okay with like, hey, no, that's crap, start over. And, and really go back to the drawing board. Um, we had to, like I said, we had to really listen when we looked at, um, when we heard of the stories in our focus groups about the impacts and the discrimination and the stigma, that was different for each of our communities. In our Asian population, it was different than in our Native American and our Latino or any other, other group, right? So we had to be flexible in pivoting and adapting to that. So when I think about that CBPR approach, um, you know, we had a, a, such a short time frame to, to work under, um, but it was really about making sure that uh, we engaged our partners at, at a, you know, at the level and that this, this was a learning, not just them learning from us, it was us learning from them. Uh, that learning goes both ways when you are implementing CBPR. And I think that's how we were able to to really try to honor kind of the conversations that we're having uh, in meetings, in text messages, in late night phone calls, um, you have it. We, we tried really hard to make sure that our community partners knew that they were very valued in our efforts. And so I just want to reiterate that, uh, that, that, that quote from that training that nothing done about us without us, because I think that's pivotal to CBPR work. Thank you, Erica. Uh, well, obviously, Bliss, you were one of those key community partners that facilitated those focal groups. So we'd love to hear your perspective on how that community-based participatory research uh, training and approach worked with partners like yourself. Thank you. I'm chuckling about some of those late night text messages and phone calls. <laughs> um, I. CBPR is a really natural fit for us in our work. Um, for, for our organization, uh, part of the foundation of our approach to our work as a community organization is a popular educa education methodology. So 
the the way that we were approached as an organization um, in the one community campaign, I think very much mirrors how we consistently try to engage our members. You know, our our sort of my my definition of doing a good job as executive director with our organization is that we're creating an organization that is a vehicle for our members to be able to realize uh, their vision. So for our members to be at the front lines of defining what the problems they, they're facing are, um, how to define those issues rather than having a, a, a definition of, rather than having health disparity explained by an external source to engage folks in defining what the barriers are and what the issues are, and also engage folks in defining what the solutions are so that our organization can become the vehicle through which to realize those solutions. And so um, for us, I think it was a very natural fit and I'm appreciative of uh, Nevada Minority Health Equity Coalition and UNLV School of Public Health really investing in that. And I hope it's something that continues forward as we're really tackling the, the vaccine question at the same time that we're tackling um, access to health insurance and broader broader topics in the in the health field. Thank you, Bliss. We're, we're getting close to that. Hopefully we'll have some news for you very shortly. Um, Andre, uh, I'd be interested just to hear, um, hear your similar response about the community-based participatory research model and training and kind of how it worked for you and your organization. Yeah, so for us, we, um, you know, we're appreciative of the, the training and the overview and the, the connections to make um, um, a contextual uh, framework for how we're going to do the work. As I mentioned before, we're a newer organization to the state of Nevada, but making impact. And with uh, COVID uh, and going to a virtual format, it really um, impacted our ability to do some community engagement and some public engagement to get the word about out about super state of quality. But using this framework um, allowed us to engage with folks um, across the state in a way that we wouldn't have before, while also providing them information, um, helping them uh, help them helping us get information and allow us to keep them engaged in the work of silver state of quality in general, but then also keep them informed uh, about COVID through our uh, social media engagement. And so for us, it really allowed us to uh, be in contact with folks um, and increase our membership, but then again, yeah, just really create these long lasting partnerships with people. Um, and we have uh, staff and colleagues out in the community that were able to make connections for us towards the, uh, the for our last listening session. So we were able to rely upon our community partners to help uh, get the word out um, and then just use the same model to continue the work that we're doing. So uh, we thought it was a great addition to the uh, that uh, the School of Public was doing. Well, thank you. I want to maybe switch gears a little bit here. We've kind of talked about uh, the projects and the process a little bit, but I think it's important for us to talk about the outcomes. And I, Bliss, I think you said some really good things there. You had some listening to the focal groups, but you're really interested in trying to find solutions. And so um, I'd be interested to hear about what challenges you identified um, in the specific population that you serve uh, during those focal groups and how this pandemic has really impacted immigrant families and then how that hopefully has led you to, to think about ways to better serve that community. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking back, um, it, it was April, uh, in April was the, was the first instance of a member passing away from COVID-19, um, which I think really, um, not that the pandemic wasn't in perspective prior to that, but um, that really brought the issues to the forefront. Um, over the course of the pandemic, I think we evolved from talking about one crisis of the public health crisis to parallel crises. Um, so COVID-19 making more visible and more tangible uh, economic and racial inequality. And, you know, we're doing, we're, doing this pro we're doing this process again right now in terms of our work for 2021. Um, and 
Our analyses have to come back to the 26 year failure of Congress to pass meaningful immigration reform. Um, and what that means is that, you know, the majority of our members are, many are in um, employment situations where uh, attempting to exercise your rights as workers under uh, Federal Labor Standards Act or Nevada revised statutes uh, provokes um, retaliation rather than health and safety perspectives in your workplace. Um, many members who we, we've had many members who were informed that if you get sick, you will not have a, a job at the same time that we're looking here in Las Vegas. We're in the metropolitan district with the highest unemployment rate in the country, uh, taking into account that 10% of Nevadans are undocumented and are not calculated into that unemployment statistic. Um, so I, in many ways, the effects that we're seeing, we've we've traced back and analyzed as, as tied to uh, the need for immediate policy solutions in regards to immigration reform, in regards to labor enforcement, um, both in terms of OSHA enforcement on, on health and safety, and in terms of um, wage and hour implementation of labor enforcement. Um, and and that lack of health, uh, the, the lack of a social security number then ties into uh, lack of health insurance, right? So all these things are compounding. Um, and I think, uh, I think a sort of predominant narrative that's come out during this time is that in fact, undocumented community members are essential. Here in Nevada and across the country, we have relied heavily on essential workers who have gone into work in unsafe work environments to ensure that we have food on the shelves at the grocery store and in our homes, um, to uh, ensure uh, that children and, and, and elders are cared for, um, that uh, the service industry continues to run to the best of its ability. And so in looking towards 2021 um, and looking towards implementation of the vaccine, on a micro level, it means ensuring that there are not barriers to undocumented community members uh, to access that vaccine alongside their uh, citizen counterparts in the same industries to ensure that their data is protected, that there are not technological or physical barriers to them accessing the vaccine. At the same time that um, nationally in the context of a new administration, we're a country that's depended on the labor of essential und undocumented workers. Um, and it's time for work authorization for those who have carried us through the pandemic that and, and immigration reform in that respect is going to start to have significant shifts for health contexts and for economic realities. Thank you. Um, Andre, similarly, uh, maybe you could tell us just a little bit about some of the things you learned uh, through those focal groups in the uh, LGBTQ plus communities and kind of where where you may be headed next based on those findings. Yes, yeah, so we learned that the um, social isolation was probably one of the greatest uh, impacts, um, compounding impacts um, for folks that we talked to. Um, other than that, I would emphasize that the LGBTQ community is suffering through COVID just like any other community. And so that's where um, things like this is the equalizer and where we see that we're, we're all just the same. Um, and even when it came to how they're going to access information and being hesitant to uh, provide or give up personal data, um, it's really the same as any other community about some of the, the concerns. Um, from a larger picture, it goes back to my earlier um, uh, points that were that the LGBTQ community is often left out of these data points. And so we are left to use national data to extrapolate any uh, findings or information. And if we could have more data that specifically talks about the LGBTQ community, then we can um, talk more specifically about the impacts or not around these things. You know, I think the thing is that we 
are can easily say um, how there are disparities and how a particular community is impacted based upon the little data that we have. But in some respects, it might be nice to find out that the LGBTQ community is not really that uh, more impacted or additional resources aren't needed uh, for interventions. But if there are, then we need the data to support that. So we really just stress um, through this project and just in general, the need for us to continue to advocate for the LGBTQ community to make ourselves available for trainings um, and for helping organizations with implementation of these, um, these projects. Again, it's just good old fashioned um, fear, homophobia, and just a lack of knowledge um, about our community that prevents people from um, doing this work. And you know, as a side note, just our little hangups about um, sexuality and sexual orientation in general. And, and I mentioned that because I had someone um, talking about a, a, another issue, but had to do around policies around the LGBT community, um, in this case, youth who are incarcerated. And they were just saying that they didn't think people wanted to be identified as their um, sexuality. And that just goes to show that um, at the end of the day, uh, that's sort of the, what we're devolved into, our sexuality. And while um, heterosexual people um, are seen as lots more richer and fuller, and you tie um, the richness and fullness of someone's life into listening sessions and information that came out, you realize that, again, the LGBT community um, is having rich, full lives that are impacted just like everyone else with a little bit of uh, caveats that aren't necessarily tied to their sexual orientation and gender identity, but tied to how um, the larger uh, discrimination and um, set aside-ness that they feel as it relates to their identity. And so we will continue to do our work to advocate uh, for this community, um, partnering with organizations that are willing to um, see this community and do work for this community and um, continue to just make uh, changes and impacts. We're able to do that in the, in the state legislature. Nevada uh, by USA Today was seen as the best state for LGBTQ people to, to live in. Um, and we just want to make sure that we keep that, uh, that, that, that trophy, that mantle. So we're going to continue to do the work. And again, just really happy uh, to be able to have the space uh, to talk about this community. So um, thanks again. Well, thank you. Um, I do want to remind our listeners that uh, we have one or two more questions for our panelists, and then we will uh, take a few questions and answers from the audience. So if you have questions for any of our panelists, please go ahead and enter those into the chat and we will try and ask them here uh, in a few minutes. So I'm going to go back to April. Thank you for patiently waiting for uh, quite a while there. But um, as a member of the contact tracing team, um, how have you been ensuring that inclusivity, cultural competency um, is being used when you're interacting with the diverse members of our community? Um, well, I'd first like to acknowledge that the UNLV campus is one of the most diverse college campuses in the country. I, I see that almost everywhere I go. Um, so the UNLV contact tracing team definitely reflects that diversity of UNLV and the greater community. Um, we've got up to 200 students on our team uh, from different backgrounds who speak more than 16 different languages, you know, things like Spanish, Chinese, Arabic, Tagalog, Farsi, Turkish, Thai, and much more. Um, so, you know, on top of that, we also have training on using something called the translator or interpreter line as needed to speak with anyone whose language, uh, which we're not familiar with. Um, so that helps eliminate those barriers as well. Um, I would say that my training focuses on kind of helping contact tracers navigate through uh, better communication skills. You know, going back to that listening piece, um, asking and listening, listening and asking more questions more than we speak. Um, having the ability to be flexible in our conversations with people instead of strictly following the script and collecting information. Um, we also have, you know, that list of community resources that we can link everyone to so we can help reach out a hand and, and show them that there's something out there for everyone, uh, for them. Um, and then, you know, there's 
sometimes those hard questions or those hard situations, um, such as when asking about demographic or sexual identity characteristics, you, um, you get some pushback sometimes there. You know, there's some questioning on, you know, what do you do with this info? Why do you need this info? Um, so we are provided with thorough training on that um, and several resources on how to phrase certain questions um, with cultural competence. Um, we ensure that contact tracers understand why we ask um, and then how we can respond to any concerns or situations like that. Well, thank you, April, and thank you for helping us lead the discussion today. And my my last question here is for Miranda. Obviously, as the, the manager of the one community effort, you were tasked with trying to reach vulnerable populations. Um, could you tell us how you think the campaign specifically did that? Yes, definitely. Um, so it was extremely important to create culturally relevant and sensitive material. I think that was our number one goal. Um, we did conduct one on one meetings with uh, the community leaders of the of the um, target groups and um, this is where they addressed the main problems and uh, struggles that the community was facing. We did we had to make sure that the community uh, leaders were involved so that we could get um, their opinion because they represent their community and um, they're really the ones who the community will listen to. Um, and uh, they were the ones that helped us tell their story and find the right language and context for their specific group. Um, but I do think that the focus groups was probably the most important part of, of, that, of that effort. Um, it was the first part of the campaign, so it was uh, the focus groups, and then came the, um, the education piece with, um, I mean, the outreach piece, sorry. And so through the focus groups, we addressed questions related to, um, to how the pandemic had affected you and your family, your group, your community, um, how you felt about the vaccine, or if you knew anything about contact tracing. And um, in the focus groups, that's definitely where we addressed those problems and the, that misinformation that a lot of people had. Um, and we were able to help them gain a, clear understanding of what and how we can help them in this effort, in this campaign. Um, so we did develop a, a wide spectrum of materials from mailers um, that were mailed out to the targets of code throughout the state, and it was translated into Spanish. Um, we had flyers that were specific to each demographic and group, uh, and those were translated into four different languages. Um, we had a commercial, like you said, the um, Wear my mask. I can't. I can't even think of the song right now. Um, but yeah, that was pretty catchy. I know that it was featured um, on YouTube, on TV. Uh, so there's that. Um, there was definitely um, uh, radio shows for some of the groups. There was um, a, a social media kit developed. There was uh, videos that we created that were also translated in Spanish. So. You name it, I feel like there was definitely a, a, a good range of um, materials that were directed towards these vulnerable groups. Um, and there was also fact sheets that were developed um, targeting the, the different groups. So I think I, I would say we did a pretty good job in, in handling that aspect of the campaign. <laughs> well, thank you, Miranda. Um, that kind of concludes our, our formal panel discussion. And uh, we do have some questions that come in from our community partners. Obviously, um, Bliss and others talked about where do we go next and how do we talk about vaccines. So we have a few vaccine questions, as you might imagine. So one of the questions that we get or things that we hear is that some people are waiting to get the vaccine um, because they feel it isn't safe. And so I think I'll just go ahead and kick this one to Brian, if you don't mind, and say, could you address those concerns and uh, let us know what your feeling is on this vaccine and answer that question for folks that are on the fence, whether they should get the vaccine or not. Well, there's clearly a lot of concern about any new medical product or vaccine that comes out because 
Uh, people don't know much about it. It's different getting a flu shot because you get a flu shot every year. People have experience with that. So it makes sense that people are concerned about uh, the safety of the vaccine, especially considering the speed with which we developed it and tested it and brought it to market. The vaccine underwent a full clinical trial, just like every other vaccine has, just like every drug does. Uh, we were able to do that because it was a large trial. We had 4,000 people enrolled in that trial. 20,000 got the vaccine and 20,000 got a placebo. And we have enough disease in our population that with even small numbers, we can show that it's effective. In vaccinating 40,000 people, uh, or well, the 20,000 who got it plus the, the other 20,000, we could get an idea of what the common side effects were. We really could study those things. Obviously, you're not going to find something that happens, you know, in one in a million people that get vaccinated, but the common problems that people had and the general safety concerns were something that we could study and we could show that the vaccine was both safe and effective. And uh, because of that speed, though, a lot of people have just said, well, you know, I get it, but I, I would rather wait just to see how other people respond to it. Uh, and from the millions of people that have gotten it so far, we've seen the exact same thing when it comes to the safety of this vaccine. So I, I think we've shown that it's a safe and effective vaccine. It's going to take time for people to to really trust that, but we're going to have to keep repeatedly um, testing it and showing those things and and talking about the concerns that people have to make sure they're comfortable when they go in to get that shot that it's not going to harm them. Well, thank you, Brian. And along those same lines, um, uh, one of the folks listening asked us about how can we best address uh, the vaccine hesitancies that we might see in our communities and maybe uh, Andre or Bliss, you might want to talk about that and say what what are things you could do or things that you might do to be able to reduce vaccine hesitancy. Uh, I'll go ahead and go. This is Andre. Um, I think uh, just good old fashioned uh, education. Um, I think one thing that we've learned is that uh, people don't change their minds until they're ready. So you can talk to someone until you're blue in the face if they're not ready to change their minds about something like taking them, then, you know, it's all uh, it's out of your hands. But I think just giving people some uh, information about the vaccine, uh, some of the possible um, concerns, where they can go to get more information, it's just the best thing to do. Someone asked me a question um, a couple of months ago about the effects of the vaccine with uh, people living with HIV and any medication that they're uh, taking. And I think there's some emerging uh, data on um, that. And so as we find out more about um, the disease in general and the vaccine specifically, uh, we can continue to educate people so they have uh, the best information that they, they have. Bliss, did you have anything you'd like to add there? Or? Sure, I I would uh, absolutely echo um, education in regards to access to experts. Recognizing that more than half of our members do not have a primary care physician. Um, one of the early steps that we've been taking is um, creating opportunities for question and answer and info session um, with medical doctors to be able to offer folks the opportunity to ask questions that they're, they're, they don't have the opportunity to ask for lack of uh, health insurance and a, and a medical provider. Um, organizationally, right now, we've got folks who want the vaccine but don't have access to it. Uh, and then we've definitely got a section of members who are wa waiting to see uh, what that experience is like for others. And so, um, my perspective is that uh, we're going to see waves of folks who who move through the vaccination process. And as we start to vaccinate those who as those who want the vaccine start to obtain access, um, that those doubts will be assuaged for others who are waiting. And if we keep moving through the coalition of the willing, I I see the path forward. Well, thank you for those comments. Um, 
I know we are uh, running out of time here, so um, I do want to make sure and thank each and every one of you, not only for your participation in the panel today, but for your continued support of our community, uh, the many vulnerable populations you serve, the coalition, and of course, the School of Public Health. I especially want to thank you, uh, April, today for co-hosting, and uh, I'd like to invite you to see if you have any last final thoughts. Thank you, Sean. I'd also like to give a shout out to you. You were a great uh, co-host throughout all this um, time as well. Um, but it sounds like public health is at work. Um, it's a great time to be in the profession and to be part of it all. Um, it feels great to be at UNLV and in Vegas where it is so diverse. And um, in the beginning, you know, Chris mentioned, and I'm just going to bring it back up again uh, to tie it all together, because um, it, it really stuck with me that diversity is a part of nature. Um, but equity, equity requires more conscientious effort. So it's comforting to know that there are organizations out there, um, everyone on this panel today, um, who are getting to work. Um, we're all pushing for that equity for all, especially for those vulnerable populations. So uh, thank you all for the work that you do. Um, the theme that came out of today's talk was it takes a village, we're better together. So it's, it takes our collective effort and there's only so much education we can provide, but it's also about that outreach, uh, the programs, uh, the community engagement and participation. So it is all making a difference. And um, I just look forward to the direction that public health is going because of all of our work and effort. So I feel motivated, I feel recharged, and I wanna thank you all for your time today. Well, thank you, April. Um... Like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's pretty impressive the quality of the students uh, that we have working in uh, in our different communities, and also the quality of a lot of the individuals we have on this panel. So I've said many times that I think public health people are a bunch of chronic do-gooders, and uh, I stick to that, and thank heaven we have them, and that we need more of them. So uh, it is certainly an exciting time to be in public health and working in public health, despite the circumstances under which uh, this has all brought things to light. So I do want to remind you, this is uh, the first of a series of conversations that will be held at UNLV. So if you would mark your calendars for the second uh, conversation, which will be held on February 17th at 1 p.m. And the topic will be understanding anti-racism in a pandemic in the UNLV campus community. So some of the things that, that make me smile a little bit is, you know, being in public health and being the dean of the school, we see different ways that we can make change in our community. And I heard Andre emphasize the importance of data and evidence and making evidence-based decisions. That's what our Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics does every day. Uh, we, we talked about how people should listen and respond and engage our communities in a meaningful fashion to help them change their behaviors. Well, that's what our social and behavioral unit does every single day. Now, we've learned how we can modify our environments to make them healthier for individuals. That's what our environmental and occupational health group does every single day. And then last but not least, we have our healthcare administration program, which helps provide access to care to the most vulnerable communities, the most vulnerable populations, helps distribute that vaccine. So if these are things that excite you or interest you, um, hopefully some people will think about careers in public health. It is a great way to be a change maker or AKA a chronic do-gooder, if you will. And so um, I do wanna thank all of our panelists today. And I do wanna remind everybody that although the vaccines are coming out, it's important for us to stay the course and be good examples. We need to continue to wear our masks and we need to wear them correctly. We have to continue to wash our hands. We have to social distance and we have to do all these things. And if you are able and willing, hopefully that you will go get vaccinated. And so the role of the contact tracers continues and becomes even more and more important as we get on the trailing end of this pandemic to isolate and eliminate those cases that we are truly all in this together as one community with one response, like our campaign said. So thank you to all of our panelists today for your time, for your effort, for your passion, and all you do to make change in our community. And uh, thank you to Provost TV uh, for your introductory comments and supporting the efforts and all of us that get to do the great work that we do at UNLV. So 
thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you.